Hello and welcome to Onc Live News Network. I'm Tara Peterson. Today we have a special program focusing on the topic of metastatic colorectal cancer. To gain insight for this multi-part series, Onc Live spoke with Dr. Tanios Pakai Saab, Professor of Medicine and Pharmacy at The Ohio State University, and Dr. Gabriella Kiorian, Associate Professor at the University of Washington and Associate Member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Institute. First line and second line treatment in metastatic colorectal cancer is fairly straightforward for the majority of patients. The greater challenge is in later line settings. In this next clip, Dr. Saab sheds some light on the therapies that have been shown to provide benefit in certain patients in this setting. Ultimately, regardless of what you do with the VEGF or VGFR, you're going to hit that wall. You go through two or three lines of therapy, three, three lines max in one, two lines max in one, and what do you do next? And this is where we end up uh, being challenged uh, about uh, what to do next. Thankfully, we have now a couple of trials uh, that suggest that in this group of patients, we may be able to salvage some patients uh, with an agent uh, like rigorafenib and the emerging agent TAS-102. So these seem to actually benefit some patients. Unfortunately, they only benefit some, not all. In fact, you can argue that they benefit maybe 10 to 15% of the patients, uh, although you expose 100% of the patients or 100% of the patients who reach that level uh, to these agents. So those few that benefit the most, uh, uh, unfortunately, have not been characterized. We don't know how to select them. We have no predictive biomarkers, no at least validated biomarkers. Uh, and uh, a lot of studies have been done. They looked at the tumors, they looked at blood. Uh, we haven't been able to find anything that would help us predict who should go on one or the other. Now, regorafenib is another VEGF inhibitor, although it hits other targets, but it's also a VEGF inhibitor for the most and probably acts like one in colorectal cancer. Uh, TAS-102 is a different type of fluoropyrimidine. It's a 5-FU-like, although it's not really 5-FU-like, uh, but it, it belongs to the same uh, global family of fluoropyrimidines. Uh, it has a different uh, mode of action. But the, the thing about it is that it, it is another chemotherapeutic agent, uh, uh, which seems to work even when 5-FU has failed. Uh, at least that's how we see it working in colorectal cancer. So very interesting. We have these two agents. Uh, they have different toxicities. Uh, we, we, can't, we don't have a predictive biomarker for any one of them, and they seem to benefit a small percent of patients. Um, but this is where I think it becomes m even more important for us uh, to consider uh, looking at uh, uh, expanding uh, the genetic analysis, uh, you know, of the tumor set, understanding and looking for other mutations or per alterations uh, the, where we we can find targets that we can go after, because our our options become so limited. I mean, certainly, regorafenib and TAS-102 are going to be there. They they play an important role for a lot of our patients. They salvage a number of them, uh, but I don't think. Uh, when we reach that second or third line uh, that we have good options for most of our patients. According to the label, regorafenib has a starting dose of 160 milligrams. However, the approach that oncologists take varies widely, both with the starting dose and with how toxicities are managed. Because of this wide variation in approaches, we asked our experts to tell us how they dose regorafenib. Now, the question of the dosage, uh, if you ask 10 oncologists, where do you start with the regorafenib, you will get 10 different answers. <laughs> so there's, there's the, the, those that love to follow the label. I'm one of them. Uh, because I think that, in my mind, if the progression-free survival on this agent is two months, I don't want to toy around with, uh, with a dose off a trial uh, in the first two months of therapy because you may miss the, your, your opportunity to see the maximum response. And 20% of the patients seem to be do, to do very well with 160. But some folks, righteously so, start at 80, others at 120, 
Some will wait a week, some will wait two weeks, some will wait a whole cycle before they change. So these are the, your 10 different answers right there. Uh, so we actually have come up with a study uh, through uh, 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 a crew, which is essentially a, an academic community, Research United uh, uh, Consortium, uh, mostly out of the Mayo Clinic, uh, to answer this question of dosage. Uh, so we have a study, a phase two randomized study, that's looking essentially at two different strategies. One is the 160, the label strategy. You go with 160 and see, see, see what you do with this arm. But the other arm is actually starting at a dose of 80 and then escalating from 80 to 120 to 160 uh, in the first four weeks. Uh, and, and so we're trying to understand in a prospective randomized fashion whether we could essentially start at a lower dose and go as tolerated versus, you know, the standard dose. And that will help us a lot with the dosage of regorafenib uh, and, and will probably help a little bit more in terms of when we think we want to take this uh, uh, back into the clinic. Uh, because like I said, you know, the big challenge today with regorafenib uh, is not whether it works or not. Most of the folks are focused on the toxicities, which, which are real. Uh, but not having a standardized way to dose the agent, uh, you know, is very problematic because I think it affects how it benefits patients in the clinic. Unfortunately, despite the survival benefit, regorafenib has not been embraced very widely in the United States. And the reason for that is a fear of toxicity. Oftentimes, we see patients treated with regorafenib at the 160 milligrams dose, continuous for three weeks out of four, dropping out of treatment due to absolutely inoxorable toxicity occurring in the first one to two weeks of treatment when they are extremely fatigued, very tired, they have severe hand foot skin reaction, sometimes diarrhea, sometimes liver function test abnormalities, and people just refuse to continue on because they are hit too hard to begin with. And, and like, luckily we have now clinical trials that are testing the possibility of actually beginning the regorafenib at a lower dose and Dr. Bekai Saab from Ohio State is spearheading the, an accrual study called the REDOS trial, where regorafenib is starting at 80 milligrams for the first week or two and escalate it slowly, depending on toxicity, up to 120 or 160, and comparing the tolerability, the side effects of this regimen with the FDA-approved regimen of 160 milligrams. Because the goal is, what good will it do to a patient to have a treatment that cannot be tolerated rather than reduce the dose, look at tolerability and advance slowly or stay at the lower dose and assess efficacy? I think this is an essential study that can actually make regorafenib more widely used if it shows as good benefit among these two uh, classes of, of um, uh, treatment arms that we're studying. With the availability of two very different agents in the refractory disease setting, there is often a question with regard to sequencing. In this next clip, Dr. Kiorian shares her perspective. TAS-102 is a very new agent, and so far we have used it uh, part of our clinical trials um, and enrolling patients into trial and giving them access to it. Uh, to be honest with you, our practice has been mostly to enroll patients into clinical trials if they are available with something novel, and therefore uh, that's why TAS-102 has been usually used first and used the regorafenib second. Having said that, now that both agents are on the market, are available, uh, we oftentimes will talk to the patients and explain the side effect profile. And it oftentimes is not a physician's decision. Sometimes it's a recommendation of what we would recommend first. My recommendations will always be first, let's do a clinical trial. So if I was to have a clinical trial and I'm looking forward to the REDOS trial being open, I would be encouraging patients to participate in a clinical trial because that's the only way we're also finding something novel, making strides, finding if not a new treatment, at least a better and newer way of administering treatment to make it more effective. So I would always propose a clinical trial as a first option, but if let's say that's not available or a patient is not interested to participate, 
uh, is describing to each and individual patient the side effects and the efficacy of each compound, informing them and letting the patient together with a physician make an opinion. In general, in general, my experience has been that patients always prefer first a treatment that has fewer side effects or at least fewer immediate side effects and uh, prefer to hold off the treatment that's potentially more toxic for later on when they really have no other choice. Uh, but it's a very individualized treatment option and again, clinical trials always come first. That's all for today's program on metastatic colorectal cancer. You can see more videos like this right here on OncLive.com. Thank you for watching OncLive News Network. I'm Tara Peterson.